Good morning, class. So the first um, theory that we will be looking at in the cognitive approach is the schema theory. You just finished an activity wherein you had to listen to me read out a passage. Some of you might not have understood what I was saying, uh, while others may have understood. And that's okay because there's a reason behind why some of you were able to understand while others of uh, others were just slightly confused or had no clue at all. Um, I will look through your Mentimeter inputs and I will put up the results and the relevance of the results in reference to a research that um, is relevant to schema theory. So to begin with, um, I will just go over schema theory and also put it in context to real life situations and other examples as well. So schema theory or schemas rather are cognitive frameworks and mental representations um, that help us organize and interpret information uh, around us. Like I said in the last class, the world is full of, I mean our environment is full of stimulus and information which can often make us feel quite overwhelmed, right? So we have all of these systems, such as SEMAs, put in place so that we can represent them in basic units. So in that sense, schemas are the most basic unit of cognitions, right? They're simple and they're representative of what our experiences in kind of like small snapshots. Um, you can compare a schema to kind of like atoms, um, atoms make up all matter, and they're also the basic, most basic unit of matter. So the same way, all schemas make up um, our cognitions, our cognitive processes. Um, so schemas are developed based on experience, and this is not necessarily experience that is firsthand. It can be secondhand experience or even just word of mouth, right? So if someone tells you something about um, a new teacher that is coming in. Oh yeah, you know, I had her in my previous school or I had him in my previous school and he's really strict. Before this person has even joined and you've had an experience um, with them personally, you've already kind of established a schema of them. So yeah, um, like I said before, schemas influence all cognitive processes at different stages. Um, this can start from what we pay attention to in the environment, how we interpret a specific situation, and how we create memory, basically how we encode memory. It can also influence how we retrieve information after it has already been um, stored in our long term. Now imagine this little girl. She, some of you may know her. She's Dora the Explorer. And I think she's a very good example of an information processor because she's constantly exploring and trying to make sense of the world. So she first sees a Yorkie. And now she is able to form a schema that dogs are small, furry, four-legged creatures with a tail. Okay. Once this schema is established, she then sees a cat and says, oh, doggy only to be corrected that not all small, furry, four-legged creatures with tail are dogs. This whole process that is involved in being able to then distinguish between the two is what is referred to as assimilation. Assimilation is when individuals incorporate new information to pre-existing schemas. Now let's say she sees a Great Dane and misinterprets that Great Dane to be a horse, because not all four-legged animals are dogs, plus Great Danes are much bigger than Yorkies. Now this child needs to make an accommodation, because this information conflicts her understanding of dogs, because now her parent is saying, no, that Great Dane is not a horse, it is in fact a dog. So then she needs to change her idea or her representation of dogs from being just small, furry, four-legged, tailed creatures to the possibility that dogs can also be big, right? So accommodation then is the process of altering pre-existing schemas to match new conflicting information. Assimilation and accommodation are the two processes involved in developing schemas and even maintaining schemas. Sometimes um, we need to do, engage in these processes in order to make our schemas as accurate or as um, credible as possible, rather. Um, when one has a specific schema about something, 
and they encounter evidence that is drastically different. Like, for example, um, seeing a Great Dane and being told that's a dog because it's so big and very different from a Yorkie can cause something which we refer to as cognitive dissonance. Uh, cognitive dissonance is basically a psychological state of distress which is caused by um, one's exposure to evidence or information that does not match their pre-existing schemas, right? It conflicts with what they know and all the new information that they're being exposed to. To get over this distress, one can assimilate um, by adding that th there are dogs that are big, right? Or accommodate also by changing the idea that not all dogs are small. But like I said before, human beings are cognitive misers. And to accommodate and assimilate, it takes effort. So a lot of the times, what they do is they ignore evidence that conflicts their pre-existing schemas. Or they only look for evidence that confirms their pre-existing schemas. A good example of unwillingness to change our pre-existing schema is gender roles in society. Some people may be unwilling to accept that women today can be independent because they have already established a schema that women need to be taken care of. That's one example. So one can say that human beings are quite rigid and schemas are often resistant to change, which is also a principle that you will come across in the socio-cultural approach. Another example that we are now familiar with is from the movie 12 Angry Men. If you can remember the movie, this guy constantly said, you know, I know his kind of people. He was just hell-bent on making sure that he received the death sentence and was guilty. He didn't care about the evidence that suggested otherwise for the longest time. He was just constantly letting his schema influence his judgment, right? His decision as to whether the boy was guilty or not. And it took him a really long time to be able to even acknowledge that there was evidence that would go against his pre-existing representation of people belonging to that group. Another person in that same movie who really works and is um, resistant to changing his own schema is this guy. I don't remember the, their names. I'm not even sure if their names were really uh, highlighted in that movie. But he works a little differently from this guy, right? His is more of a social schema where he has an impression of a specific group of people. This guy has a schema from personal experience, okay? And he says, all children are ungrateful. And the whole case was around a, a potential murder of a child, you know, murdering the father. And he is the last to cave and, you know, agree that the child, I mean, the boy is not guilty because he has already established from his experience with his son, who no longer talks to him, that children are ungrateful, right? And he wants his own vengeance or revenge over that fact to play out here. And again, he is also not able to rationally make decisions and say that, okay, you know, these are the evidences that are um, provided against the fact that this, ki this kid could be the murderer. He, right till the end, does not acknowledge that because he already has um, a schema. And that is, again, very resistant to change. And it would take a lot more effort for him to agree and acknowledge and use the evidence that the others were providing. So early childhood is a very important time where we develop um, schemas, right? And this really does influence how we see the world and interact later on in life. Schemas are broad and pervasive, and when they are so deep-rooted, I mean, growing up, you are developing this, and you see, this is where you're starting to really understand yourself. So it is deep-rooted because it lasts longer, and it's pervasive throughout your childhood. So because of that, these 
schemas that you create